Well, I hope you enjoyed the first exam. Um, now I'm going to uh, briefly go over the exam and uh, explain uh, the grading uh, and uh, talk about some of the more tricky uh, questions in a uh, little bit more detail. All right, um, ionization energy, uh, oxygen, fluorine, neon, or sodium. Um, this is a similar question that you found in the practice exam. So uh, in this case, neon is the only atom that has a closed shell. So it should have the highest ionization energy, um, given that uh, these four atoms are closely uh, clustered together. Uh, for the second question, uh, atomic radii, uh, aldehyde, telluride, and xenon. Uh, those three have the same kind of electronic configuration. They have the same number of electrons, but different number of nuclear charges. So in this case, the largest nuclear charge will produce the smallest diameter. Okay, so uh, the sequence would be telluride greater than aldehyde greater than uh, xenon. Uh, for this two, the grading is pretty straightforward. You either get it or not. Uh, the third question, uh, one and only one example of atomic orbitals that fulfills each of the following requirements. Um, the first is um, the, uh, it's about symmetry. So uh, it's asking for uh, atomic orbital that has a C2 as the highest order uh, of proper rotation uh, axis. Um, <clears throat> so having a C2 as the highest order of proper rotational axis would eliminate S orbitals because um, S orbitals is, is spherical in shape. So they will have uh, C infinity everywhere. Uh, it will also eliminate p orbitals because uh, p orbitals also have uh, c infinity axis. Um, for example, c uh, p x uh, has a c infinity along the x axis. Okay. Uh, d orbitals could fulfill this requirement. Uh, at least some of the d orbitals: uh, d x y, d y z, uh, d x z, and d x squared minus y squared. Uh, all fulfill this question. Dz squared does not because it has a um, <coughs> because it has a c infinity axis along the z. Okay. So uh, all you need to do is to uh, write down any one of the four d orbitals. The or uh, an orbital that can form delta bond. Uh, this again uh, limit our choice to. Uh, D orbitals because delta bond can only be formed by uh, D orbitals um, by aligning four lobes of the uh, D orbitals together. So it's a uh, so delta bond looks like two sets of uh, pi bond perpendicular to each other. Okay. So this can be done by having dxy and dxy or dxz um, with dxz. So if you have dxy with dxy, it should be along the z-axis. If you have dxz uh, overlapping with dxz, it should be along the y-axis, so on and so forth. Again, any one of the four d orbitals should work. All right, the next question is about uh, Vesper theory. Um, <coughs> so the important thing here is to uh, Calculate the number of lone pairs and the steric number. Okay. And uh, after done that, uh, you should uh, sketch the standard geometry and think about where to place the lone pairs and uh, uh, multiple bonds. Okay. Uh, boron tri uh, sorry, bromium trifluoride. Um, uh, the number of lone pairs are two, so seven electrons for bromine, minus three used for uh, forming single bonds with fluorine. So that produced two lone pairs with the steric number of five, so that's trigonal by pyramidal, um, including the lone pairs. 
the lone pairs should be placed on the equatorial position to minimize 90 degree interactions. We talk about this a uh, number of times in class. Uh, the overall shape of the molecule would be a T, uh, and you could argue that the top and the bottom, uh, the two ax axial fluorine atoms could be pushed slightly uh, away from us, so it's a slightly bended T shape. Boron trifluoride, uh, no lone pair. Boron has three uh, valence charge electrons and forming three bonds with fluorines. So no lone pair, steric number three, so that's uh, triangular in shape. Uh, N3 minus, this is, the, uh, this is a molecule we discussed in lecture. We talk about how by putting the charge at the wrong place. Okay, if you recall, the negative charge in the, uh, in the azide uh, is located on the ligand atoms. So in this case, the positive charge is located on the central nitrogen, and two negative charges, one each, located on the two ligand nitrogen atoms. Okay. Um, and if you uh, correctly identify the location of the uh, partial char uh, the charges, you should be able to calculate the number of lone pairs should be zero and the ligand atoms are two, so step number two, uh, the overall structure will be linear. Going down the next one, xenon, dioxygen, difluorine. Xenon has eight electrons. Each oxygen requires two uh, electrons to form covalent bond, and fluorine requires one. So a total of six electrons required to form the, the covalent bonds. That leaves one lone pair. Uh, so steric number five. Uh, again, we should think about where to place the lone pairs. Uh, lone pairs should be placed on the uh, equatorial position. And uh, for the double bonded oxygen, they should also be uh, located on the equatorial position, again, to minimize nine, the number of 90 degree interactions. Okay. For example, in this case, if you place the oxygen on the equatorial position, there's no 90 degree interaction between oxygen and the lone pair. However, if you place the oxygen on the axial location, suddenly there is uh, oxygen lone pair interaction. So having oxygen on axial location is not preferred. Uh, so the overall shape of the molecule uh, would, would be a seesaw. All right, going down the next one, uh, item E, telluran tetrafluoride uh, two minus. Um, two negative charges are located on telluran. So you should add two to the uh, number of valence electrons, which is six in this case, and then subtract four, which is the number of electrons used to form covalent bond with fluorine. So that gives you two lone pairs. Uh, steric number equals six, so uh, a tetrahedron structure, and you have two lone pairs, and these two should be on top and bottom, so as far away from each other as possible. The overall shape of the molecule would be square planar. All right, symmetry. Um, the first one, dibromomethane. Uh, I believe we discussed a similar molecule in uh, in class, uh, dichloromethane. Uh, this is a C2V. Um, the C2 goes uh, through the carbon atom and it bisects the bromine carbon bromine bond and also hydrogen carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, the second question is, uh, is pretty challenging. Uh, it's, the answer is, is D2D. Um, it's pretty easy to identify a C2 in this molecule, um, but it's a bit challenging to identify the other two C2s that are perpendicular to the to the C2 that goes along the carbon-carbon-carbon uh, chain. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about this in the next slide. Uh, 
I molecule C a set length. Uh, this is d infinity h because it's symmetrical. Number four, uh, this organic molecule is planar. It's an aromatic system. Uh, so it has a C2 that goes through uh, the two carbon atoms shared by the two rings. It goes through the middle of the uh, two carbon atoms and it's perpendicular to the plane of the paper. Okay, so that is a C2. And there is a mirror plane, which is the plane of the molecule that is perpendicular to the C2. Uh, so that will push you all the way to C2H. Um, molecule E, FN, we uh, discussed this in uh, one of the previous video lectures, I believe. Uh, we talked about two different kind of conformations, staggered and eclipsed. Um, so for FN, I have the uh, staggered conformation shown on the right. And this is D3D. Uh, the challenging part is, uh, is to identify the C2s that are perpendicular to the C3. Uh, for the ferrocene, eclipsed conformation is pretty easy to identify that being D5H. Now going back to molecule B, uh, the, as I said, there's a C2 that goes through the carbon, carbon, carbon linkage. So all the three carbons, uh, the carbon-carbon bond uh, is, the, uh, is, the, uh, is one of the C2s. Now the two uh, double bonds are perpendicular to each other and that makes the molecule uh, a 3D structure instead of a planar molecule. Okay, so the two sets of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms are not on the same plane. Okay, so the two hydrogens on the left carbon atom is on the plane of the paper, but the CH2 on the right is um, has one of the hydrogen above and the other hydrogen atom below the plane of the paper. Now there are also actually two other C2s perpendicular to the existing C2. Uh, you can see this C2 in the two views on the left. So the C2s go through the central uh, the center carbon atom and uh, it sort of bisects the hydrogen carbon hydrogen uh, carbon, uh, uh, the dihedral angle. Okay. Another way of to visualize this is to put the molecule into a uh, into a familiar structure. So what I have here is a box, and I have four uh, balls representing the four hydrogen atoms. So this is similar to the cube we used in uh, discussing the methane uh, symmetry uh, properties. So if you put the molecule into this box, you are able to find pretty easily that uh, there are C2s going through the center of each pair of faces. So the top and bottom center has a C2. Uh, the left and the right uh, face centers, uh, uh, is, there's a C2 there as well. And you can convince yourself pretty easily that if you rotate the molecule along those axes, you will be able to rotate one hydrogen atom to the other. And also the carbon atoms will be rotated on, onto one, uh, one uh, over the other. All right, so this is a D2D molecule because it has a C2 and the two other C2s perpendicular to the C2. And also two sets of uh, mirror plants contain, that contain the uh, the primary C the primary C two axis so it's D two D. I have to say this is a very challenging uh, molecule. So you should uh, be proud of yourself if you figure this out. Oh, uh, now the grading for this and the previous Vespa theory is pretty simple. You either get it or not. Uh, in the Vespa theory case, uh, if you uh, showed the process, uh, you, if you explain your work and have correct intermediate uh, results, you should get partial credit. Uh, but for the symmetry uh, point group and assignment, there's no, no partial, um, uh, there's no partial credit available.
All right, going to the next question. Uh, this is a resonance structure. And the molecule in question has two carbon nitrogen bonds, R1 and R2. R1 is 1.29 angstrom, and the R2 is 1.46 angstrom. So one is significantly shorter than the other one. And one way to explain this is to use resonance structure. Um, this is a pretty standard organic chemistry stuff. Um, you can draw a resonance structure that has a double bond between carb uh, carbonyl carbon and the nitrogen atom. And that will place a positive partial charge uh, on the nitrogen and a negative charge on oxygen. So, um, so this is a less stable structure, uh, which means its contribution to the final structure would be less than the resonance structure I drew on the left. Okay. But it still gives a partial double bond character to this uh, carbon-nitrogen bond. And that makes R1 shorter because it has some double bond character. All right. so. Um, the grading here, again, is going to be pretty uh, straightforward. If you uh, sketched the correct resonance structure uh, and explained using uh, the, uh, the features okay, of the CN double bond, then you should get 10 points. Those are two things I'm looking at. If you uh, drew the correct resonance structure but uh, did not explain things well, you should get at least five points for the resonance structure. If you uh, have some indication that you understand uh, the resonance structure um, but you didn't draw it or didn't draw it correct correctly, you should get some points uh, depending on how much you put in the exam. All right, last question. Uh, this is the MO diagram. This is very similar to, uh, uh, to the nitrogens, if not identical uh, for us. So qualitative uh, diagram should be exactly the same as the one for nitrogen, with sigma g being higher than pi u. Um, so this is a case with significant uh, SP mixing, okay. and you should place electrons uh, up all the way to pi u. Okay. Carbon atom has two uh, two p ele uh, electrons and two two s electrons. Okay. So uh, so each um, uh, each carbon atom contribute four, and two atoms contribute eight electrons to the molecule. <laughs> And the bond order in this case will be uh, will be two. Now, if you add two more electrons to the system, these two electrons will be placed in sigma g, <clears throat> and that will increase the bond order to three. So similar to nitrogen. Uh, and what that means is um, between C two and C two two minus, C two two minus uh, would have a higher bond order and shorter bond length. Grading wise, um, 10 points for the MO diagram, and uh, you will get partial penalties uh, for incorrect labels or wrong number of electrons. It all depends on the specific situation. For the second part, um, as long as you identify C22 minus as the uh, structure having shorter bond, then you should get five points. Uh, if you uh, does not make that correct prediction, but showed some understanding that uh, there's the involvement of uh, bond order and there's correlation between bond order and uh, bond length, then you should at least get uh, two or one or two partial point of partial credit, depending on uh, how much you put in the exam. Okay, um, so that will conclude our um, review today. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, take another look at your exam because in future exams, as I said before in class, I will be taking some of the problems in this exam and reuse it in the next exam.
So it's to your advantage to make sure that you really understand um, each problem and uh, be able to reproduce the data on your own. Okay. So uh, in future days, I'm going to post the empty exam so you can download them um, and practice on your own. All right. Um, I guess we'll see each other uh, again on Monday in another video lecture. And we'll see each other in person on next Wednesday. Uh, have a great weekend.